Good morning. So by the time we head out of chapel and off to our e-block classes, we will be within 48 hours of Thanksgiving break beginning. We are almost there. I've long thought that this break is about the most important one in our year. We work hard and fast through the fall in and out of classrooms and in ways that tire us out. Well, not as long as the breaks awaiting us in the winter and spring, Thanksgiving break allows us to step away and gather ourselves for the push to the end of the semester while enjoying my favorite holiday of the year, Thanksgiving. We return to classes and winter activities that much closer to winter break, and then winter term in January, lots to be excited about. Before lurching ahead, however, and when thinking about our fall, it will not likely come as a surprise to know that I have enjoyed and loved the time we have spent together here in Ashburn Chapel since beginning the year way back on September 5th. There is a lot to love, I think. I love being in this building, the history of it, the fact that it is the only building on our campus that every living Brooksian has spent time in since it was built in 1930. I love the opportunity we have to sit and think with Reverend Afori leading a meaningful moment. I love the readings that Mr. Chapman selects with the speaker in mind. I love the audible excitement when we're about to sing a favorite hymn. I love the benediction we finish with each time we are here. Yet what I love most about this space and the time we spend here is what we learn about and from members of our community when they stand where I'm standing and share a part of themselves with all of us. I don't think that's a small thing. And each time that happens, we get a bit closer to knowing one another and being known to one another in ways that strengthen our community. I believe that. So with my favorite holiday, Thanksgiving, in mind, and a desire to contribute to what I most love about being in chapel together, I want to tell you a story. It is my favorite story. It is a true story. And it is a story I have told only on two other occasions in chapel. It is a story about how I met the most important person in my life, the person I'm most thankful for in my life, the love of my life. It all started on a Friday, November 11th, 1994, a long time ago. It was a day like any ordinary day. I was in my office in what is now Merriman Dormitory, the second to last room on the left as you walk down that first floor hallway. I was in my first year as assistant dean of students, my fifth year at Brooks, and we were closing in that morning on it being time to head to school meeting in the auditorium, a building that is no longer with us. We had a speaker visiting as part of a young alumni and alumna speaker series. This particular speaker had graduated from Brooks in 1987, first in her class, gone to Harvard College, where she graduated magna cum laude with a degree in economics in 1991, and had been working in Washington for the Council of Economic Advisors, the National Economic Council, and as a member of the Clinton administration's health care task force, an early attempt to pass a national health insurance program. She was scheduled to speak to the school about health care reform in school meeting. And the plan was to have her visit my United States government and politics course later that afternoon. I was tied up with something, was running behind in my effort to get out the door and up the hill to the auditorium when Judy Chisholm, the school registrar at the time, who occupied the office right next to mine, came around the corner and poked her head into my office saying, 
I think you should go to school meeting. Now that was not a common occurrence. I was puzzled. I was a bit annoyed. And after replying in some insufficient way, she said in her inimitable Mrs. Chisholm way that was certain to get your attention, John, go to school meeting. When Mrs. Chisholm told you to do something, you did it. So off I went. By this time I was late and the speaker had already gotten well into her talk. The auditorium was really just an old barn without enough seats and it filled up quickly during school meeting. So if you were late, you generally got stuck in the entryway, able to hear the speaker, but not able to see the speaker. Eventually, her talk transitioned to questions and answers, followed by meeting, uh, the meeting ending and students and faculty members making their way out of the building. With an opening to get through the doors, I figured I should at least meet this person who was coming to my class later that day. I pushed through a few people, made my way into an opening, turned to my left, and there she was, our speaker, tied up in conversation with a few students, asking follow-up questions about health care reform. Hmm, I thought as I looked at her more closely. She sure looks like a really interesting person. I better get myself well prepared for that class scheduled later in the day. So I left the auditorium without actually saying hello, only thinking about it and definitely looking forward to it. After squaring away my lesson plan for the day, and reminding every student in the class to be prepared with questions that would make them look impressive. I carried on with my day. Our speaker spent the middle of the day with Miss Crump Burbank, who had been her field hockey and softball coach when she attended Brooks. Eventually, two o'clock rolled around and it was time for class. My classroom at the time was located in what is now the Dean's Den. It was a great group of kids in the classes of 1995 and 1996, all of whom are now in their mid-40s. They were a lively and spirited group. I had advisees in the class, boys who were on our soccer team, and some really super people. In fact, one of them is currently a vice president on our board of trustees, my boss. We were settled in and the speaker eventually turned up at the door for the visit. My especially well-prepared group fired away with impressive questions, rising to the occasion and not letting me down. The speaker held up well with my super impressive group of students and I thought, wow, she is really impressive. So I thanked her for visiting, politely walked her to the car, waiting for her outside, and away she went. All of you know that it can be a rush to get from last period class to the start of practice or rehearsal in the afternoon. And I was already running behind. So I pulled myself together and rushed to get out to the field. I was scrambling to get squared away to begin practice, and the first person I bump into was T.J. Morton, my advisee, a student in the class, and a player on our team. He says, without even the slightest bit of hesitation, you liked her, I know it. <laughs> I was stunned and taken aback. What? I replied. He then said, you heard me, you like her, just admit it. I did my best to fend him off with, no I don't, but it was too late. Others on the team who had been in the class joined the chorus, come on, you liked her, 
Don't you? It was obvious. Finally, we turned to practicing. I escaped their attention and headed into the weekend, but they were right. What to do, I thought. First things first, I did have to thank this very kind and talented and impressive person for taking time out of her busy schedule to visit my class. After all, it would be rude not to do that. But I didn't want to overdo it. I wanted to show some interest, but not too much interest. I suspect you might know what I mean. In those days, email had barely begun. Voicemail was cutting edge technology. And no one on this campus had a cell phone. That meant I had to put pen to paper. And I wrote the most important letter of my life very carefully. Dear Miss O'Neill, thank you for visiting my class this past Friday. I found your work on the healthcare task force to be fascinating. If you ever find yourself back in this area and are interested in talking some more about your work, I would love to learn more about your job. <laughs> Brilliant, I thought. So I put the letter in the mail and then waited for what seemed like an eternity for any kind of reply. Finally, it came in the form of a voicemail. Hi, John. It would be very interesting to meet with you and talk some more about my job. I'll be home to celebrate Thanksgiving with my family, and perhaps we can meet then. Ugh, I thought. The ball was back in my court. What next? So I turned to some friends for advice. Ask her to lunch, they all said. I like that. Don't be too eager. Keep it simple. By this point, we had graduated to actually talking on the phone, and I proposed having lunch on the day after Thanksgiving. She said, I can't do lunch, but I could do dinner. Well, OK then, I said in my head, while replying, sounds great, to her. So two weeks after meeting in my classroom, we had dinner at the loft <laughs> and talked some more about her job. We continued to talk about her job the next day before she headed back to Washington. We remained in touch and I spent the better part of winter vacation visiting her in Washington. We spent more time together in January, and then I asked her sister, who I barely knew, to help me pick out an engagement ring, which was not an inexpensive strategy. Incredibly, her sister said yes. I then asked her father, who I barely knew, for his permission to ask her to marry me. Incredibly, he said yes. So I boarded a plane for Washington in late January 1995, engagement ring in hand, and I invited this really, really, really interesting person who I met in a Brooks School classroom to join me at the Lincoln Memorial where I asked her to marry me. Incredibly, she said yes. We set the date for the Saturday after Thanksgiving, November 25th, 1995. And it just so happens that November 25th falls on the Saturday after Thanksgiving this year too, 28 years after Mrs. Packard and I were married. I head into this Thanksgiving break thankful for all that we have given to the school and one another over the course of these past 11 weeks here in chapel and everywhere on our campus. I also head into this Thanksgiving break and 28th wedding anniversary one week from Saturday 
profoundly thankful to be finding my way through life with Kimberly O'Neill Packard, the greatest stroke of good luck I will ever have. I hope all of you get the rest you deserve, enjoy time with people who are important to you, and return ready to get all we can out of what is certain to be a terrific winter at Brooks School. Have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you.